He's got his mixing bowl. Good stuff. God bless you. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you? Pastor Carmen said usually get out around 2 o'clock, so that's perfect timing. Perfect timing. 2 or 3. It's really good to, uh, to see you all here today. Thank you, Pastor Carmen, for this opportunity. And I just want to say, um, if you ever have anybody in your life that you can always look back to wherever you're at, and like, if you're in a bad state in life, or, or you know, for me, it's in ministry. You ever have times in ministry where you're just like, am I doing it right? Am I, should I be here? Is everything going the way it should be going? And you get kind of confused. I had people that I could look back to just with, just with images, and that's like Maurice and Maureen. I would think about them, and I would get comfortable. I would feel okay because it was like, I remember them putting up with all of our stupidity. But more importantly, pouring into the, this over and over and over again. And though I have not seen them in, in, I think it's 12, 13 years, 13 years, it's like, it's just old family. They come in and, and just the same thing. I could be around them and I feel safe. And um, they are great people and this church is, is fortunate that they're so close to this. And I encourage you, uh, help them in your prayers and help them with your giving because they're going to do something big for the Lord. They already are and it's going to be huge in that place. And I count it a privilege to know them. So it's great to see you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do. If you have your Bibles, we're going to get to the Bible and we're going to get to the Word. So turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. It's before Colossians, after Ephesians, and it's page 2246, if you want. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. This is right after Paul is just speaking about the things he's going through in prison, where some people in when he's in prison, are, are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ out of love and passion for him and out of spite for him. And he says, well, whatever way it's spoken, I don't care. The message is getting out. He's talking about how it's tough in prison and how if he lives or dies, it's okay with him. And he writes this. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's kind of like the theme scripture for every Christian, or should be. It should be a theme of scripture for everybody in here today. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Father, I thank you for the word. I pray, Lord, that you will speak through me to this amazing congregation. May we have an awesome time in your presence. In Jesus' name, everyone says, amen. amen. Now, <clears throat> in 1964, there was a great movie that was released about a magical nanny who helped a banker and his family get closer through some songs and silliness. Do you know what movie this is? Mary Poppins. Yes, it was Mary Poppins. And, and, and one of the, she sung a song in this because there's a point where these kids need to take medicine. And I remember growing up in the 80s and taking medicine and being terrified of it because it tasted like turpentine or something really bad. And so in this, what Mary Poppins had this idea of taking the bitterness of medicine and adding a spoonful of sugar because it helps the medicine go down. The medicine go down. The medicine go down. Just a spoonful of sugar. I can't get started on that. I thought about that and of course, you know, I, I think movies from the 60s are weird anyway. Anything that's from the 60s or in black and white is just not watchable for me, but I'm, I'm weird myself. <laughs> but I was thinking about that and, and, you know, I, I feel like in our, in our day and age in, in, in Christianity that there's an awful lot of Mary Poppins believers. What do you mean? Well, we fly with umbrellas way too much. It's just horrible. No, that's not what I mean. I, I mean, we take a spoonful of the goodness of God. We take a spoonful of the connection with God. We take a spoonful of, of faith and just add it to the bitterness of our life. And that's not God's best for you. That's not God's best. God's best for you is not to take a spoonful of his goodness, of his mercy, of his love, and just add it to the brokenness of your life. His best for you is to have a substitution, to transfer the goodness of God for the badness and, and bitterness of our lives. But as believers and as people who just live in life that go through ups and goes through down, guess what? We, we sometimes get just a spoonful of God's goodness on a Sunday, 
and we go through life just fighting to get through when God's best for us is joy unspeakable and full of glory. When God's best is the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I go through tough times, but I'm beginning to learn that God's with me and faithful through all of it. And I don't need just a little bit on Sunday. I can have the whole thing all the time. I got a way to illustrate it. It's kind of fun for me and not so much for you. Because I get to play with cookie dough. Now, now watch this. All right. Sorry, this is... There we go. Look at this. Oh. This is... Mmm. I bet you wish you were me. Oh, so good. When I was a kid, my mom would make cookies, and I'd try to eat as much dough as I possibly could, and she'd always get mad at me. This is the goodness. <laughs> of course it's the goodness. It's the goodness of the Lord. Just a little piece of it, though. So what we do with the goodness of the Lord in our life, and, and, and we take our life. Now, our life is just a mixture of a whole bunch of stuff. Good stuff, exciting stuff, but also bitter stuff, hard stuff, difficult stuff. How many have ever faced some difficult things in life? Life hasn't been always easy. It's been tough. And so sometimes what we do as believers is we take a little bit of the goodness of the Lord and we just add it to our life. Now, what's in our life? It's, it's dirt. It's grime. Life is messy, isn't it? Sin is messy. Sorrow is messy. Pain is messy. Frustration, bitterness, it's all messy. And so what happens is we get the goodness of the Lord, and we put it into our life, and then it just begins to get, it gets diluted in the messiness of our, of our life. It gets diluted in, in, in the pain we face because it's not because God's not good. It's because we've only given him a little piece. It's because we've only taken a little piece. It's because we only find a room for the Lord in our life. Now, as believers, the Lord has called us to, to live a, a life of becoming more than overcomers. The Bible doesn't say that we're victorious. He says we're more than overcomers. We're more than victorious. We claim land that the enemy, the Bible says, he restores time, he restores, restores years, he restores things that have been taken from us. That's the promises of heaven. But as believers, we sometimes just find a spot for God to fit in our broken lives, and he becomes like this. What was once a, a wonderful looking piece of cookie dough is now a disgusting thing. No matter what you do with this, you cook it, you put, put it in the fridge for a while, keep it. you're never going to want to put this in your mouth because it's broken, it's gross. It's, but this is what the power of God becomes in our life when we only give him a piece. He doesn't change. The cookie is still there. The dough is still there. All the ingredients that make up cookie dough is still there, but it's covered in the dirt and grime of our life. When we become a Mary Poppins Christian, we become somebody who loves God, who wants God, but only wants a little peace. But says, here's my busy life, Lord, and I want you to fit right here. Not so much in the center of my life, but maybe behind the fourth rib on my left. And, and that's where you fit. And when we, when we, when we do that, we actually, we actually hurt ourselves. When we do that, we actually hurt the, the, the power and the force that God wants to put inside of you because the majesty and power and, and anointing and spirit of, of healing and deliverance that God wants us to walk in daily, day after day after day after day, gets weakened and small. Not because God gets weakened, but because our faith isn't there. Because our desire isn't there. Because we're too, much, we're too, too focused on our broken life and less focused on the goodness of God. And so this message is about that. It's about us realizing that God has some good things for us. God has some good life for us. Now, I've been, I've been kind of going through a spiritual journey myself of being a, being a person who's kind of, kind of just happy with the status quo to a person who expects more in the, in the things of God. Now, when I read the Bible, I read stories of healing. I read stories of, 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 of salvation. I read stories of, of open blind, blind eyes being open and deaf ears being open. And I begin to realize that God wants more for this 21st century church. But this is not what he's expecting. This is not what he wants. When I read stories of radical believers in God, guess what? They're normal people, like you and me. They're normal people. They're people who went to school, maybe didn't go to school. They're people who decided that, you know what? This is not good enough for me. A little bit of God in my life is not good enough for me. And it doesn't have to start when you're young. My, one of my... One of my great teachers in, in Bible college was a man named Lawrence Bodley. He was also called to missions. He was called to missions 25 years before I got to school, and he never got to go because the door wasn't open. But you know what? He didn't live a life where he just put God 
in his life. He took his life and gave it to Jesus, and Jesus became the center of it all for him. And what happened with him was he would be, he was a man of the word, a man of study, a man of prayer. Everything was about Jesus in one day, in a chapel service, a prophet, a man with a prophetic anointing on his life, looked at him, never saw him before. He was sitting on the front row, and he said, pack your bags. Pack your bags. Didn't know him, from, didn't know him at all. Pack your bags. He stood up, and he began to cry and weep, and he never does. And, and they called him up. He went and put his jacket on because he was a prim and proper Presbyterian who was filled with the Holy Ghost, which is awesome. <laughs> and, and, he, and he just, he came up, and he was broken. In two years, he was in Vanuatu in the, in the South Pacific. Preaching the gospel at a place 100 years ago, no one knew Jesus. But he was 60 years old when he finally got to go. So I'm looking at some younger people, and I'm looking at some experienced people. <laughs> Experience, that's a good word. And I'm here to tell you that it's never too late to take Jesus and make him fully the center of your existence. You don't know, like, I, 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 feel, I feel I should say this, but I don't want to be offensive, but I'm not. I'm going to say it anyway because I'm leaving. <laughs> if you're an older, older believer, and you may look at some of these younger people that look weird, have weird hair, piercings where piercings don't belong, and stuff, and you're like, what can I do with that, you know? And, you know, if you're serious, you probably feel that way. You're like, yeah, it's weird. It's like he tripped at a fishing store and fell, and boom, style, it's great. But the reality is, is that, they, uh, that these young people need you. And these young people, I got dirt in my mouth. Look at that. And these young people need some elderly and, and, some, and some experienced people who are not this. I need it. There are some amazing people in my church, 60, 70, 80 years old, that I can look to, I can sit down to, and I can just stare and walk, listen to the stories that they have to tell. You know what it does for me? It builds my faith because they're not living like this. And when I feel like I want to live like this, they turn it around. Because they tell me about a story when they were like 35 years old. When they were 30, when they were 40, about how life was like this, but God got a hold of their life and changed everything. You know what it did for me? That got a hold of my life before I went to here. So it doesn't matter if you're young and it doesn't matter if you're old. This doesn't have to be your life. You can be different today. You can say, God, no longer am I just going to add a teaspoon, a spoonful of your goodness to help the bitterness of my life. Because that's not, it doesn't help. A teaspoon of Christianity, a teaspoon of Jesus, you know what that does? That, that makes life frustrating. That makes life confusing because you look and hear all these stories about the goodness of God, but it doesn't happen to us. Not because God's not faithful, not because God doesn't love you, but because we have diluted his power in our own life with all the stuff that shouldn't be there in the first place. But it's time for us to say no more. It's all about Jesus. The Bible says in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, a scripture verse that my son Nate knows perfectly, anyone is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. That tells me that this old life doesn't have to be a part of the new life. Isn't that awesome? That's the hope we have as believers, that the old life doesn't have to be part of the new life. I love what you said, Maurice. Some Christians today, I wouldn't want what they have. We can be the greatest tool of evangelism and the worst tool of evangelism. Because if someone who's really broken, how many of you guys know someone who's not saved today? How many of you guys know someone who's not saved some of those people that we know that aren't saved are in utter destruction. They are in depravity. I know people who come to our church that are addicted to everything you can think of. They are broken people, and they hear a message of hope, and they come to the altar, and they get saved, and they weep and cry. But you see, if, if, if their example was someone who faces the same thing all the time, it's not going to change them. I have a story about my, my youth group a few years ago. We had this ministry out to this place called Old Town where we fill up a 15-passenger van with a bunch of students from Old Town. And for some reason, you know, we had great services with them. We saw God move over their hearts. They gave their life to the Lord and everything like that. And we were all excited. I was meeting with this main kid that was there. And, um, and, and we were all excited about what God was doing. But after a while, things just started unraveling, and we kept meeting with kids and kept pouring into kids, and it just kept unraveling and unraveling, and I was like, I don't know what is going on. And that was one of those moments where I needed to think about people like Maurice and Maureen and my parents and everybody who's gone through things in the past. And I was like, am I doing wrong? And I seriously thought about just going to Home Depot and putting on an apron 
and just saying, yep, this is what I'm going to do. Forget it. Because it was just so frustrating. And I, and I, I met with the, the, the kid who really was spearheading the thing. And what I found out was this was his heart. That this was his life. He was addicted to bath salts. He was on drugs. He was doing everything that everyone was doing. And so as an example of what Christianity is to his broken friends, they saw this. Well, does that mean you have to be perfect in order to be safe? No, absolutely not. But, but you don't have to be this either. You see, the Bible says anyone in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And that's kind of like where I really want us to get as believers in Jesus. The old life does not, any, does not have to have any say in your new life. You see, your spirit becomes renewed when God saves you. And your flesh is still your flesh. So basically, it comes down to our minds. Which way are we going to think? Which way are we going to live? And if we get this theme verse in our hearts and in our minds every single day, it's going to make those choices that much easier for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And so when we're tempted to go down that path that's going to fill our flesh, and, and, and so we go to church on Sunday and get that spoonful of goodness and pour it over us, and then we go down our life and just do whatever we want. It's not that God's looking at you and trying to beat you and say, like, you are a dirty, rotten sinner. No, it's like, you're missing out on the good stuff. You're missing all the stuff that I've got for you. You're missing the life that brings joy when joy shouldn't be there. You're missing freedom from all of this stuff. Why? Because you're only getting a spoonful of my goodness once a week. And that's not good enough for, that's not good enough for what God wants for you. You know why? I'm a parent now. Four children. Praise the Lord. Four is a beautiful number. Five is the devil. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Lord, it's a great number. And when I look at my kids, I want them to go farther than me. I want them to be taller than me, except Hannah, because, well, maybe, who knows. And, and I want them to be smarter than me. I want them to make more money than me. I want them to have more of an impact on me because they're my kids, and I want them to succeed. And so if they're not doing the best they can do, it riles me up because I'm like, you can do better. That's the same way with the Lord. With you, when he sees you only taking a teaspoon, just a spoonful of what he wants you to have once a week, he looks at you and says, I know you can do better. I've got something so much better for you. Forget that old stuff. Come to the new. Be part of the Make it everything that you are. Make Jesus the center of your, your, your life. Now, I'm just going to move forward for time's sake here to talk about just three quick things that Paul the Apostle in the book of Philippians talked about with this new life, okay? And, and, and the scripture verse is found in Philippians 3, 7 to 9. It says this. Listen to this. Paul's speaking about his education, his knowledge, his stature, and people, and his importance, okay? Now, this is what he says. I once thought these things were valuable. He was talking about how, how good he was in the Pharisaical world. Everybody knew Paul. He was the up-and-comer. He was the guy. <clears throat> but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. So what is he saying here? He's saying three things that I can see that go along with this idea of making Jesus everything, not just a little bit of our lives, okay? Because that's really what this is all about. It's about changing our perspective, changing the way we think to become people who are completely Christ-centered, rather than just adding Christ to our center, making our life all about Jesus. The first thing he says, the valuable things of my life became worthless. And that's really the truth. The valuable things, he says, well, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless. He had a lot to be proud of. A lot to be proud of. He was the up-and-comer in his field. He had the world by the tail, the ad admiration of his peers. And all these things served him to do was puff him up and make him smart. To, to, to totally blind his mind to the good things of life. It got to the point where he was killing believers and thinking he was doing God's work. See, when we get so focused on the material things, we lose sight of the spiritual things, which are the eternal things. It's not, it's not bad to be successful. It's not bad to have a great job. But what happens is when that becomes our focus, we lose the power that God has and the effectiveness of our position. Everything you do, for, everything you do in life Praise the Lord we don't have six billion preachers in this, in this world because that would be horrible. A bunch of people yelling at each other all day. That's all it would be. You'd walk down the street. 
Hello, brother! Hello! Praise the Lord! Yeah! Meanwhile, houses are falling down and plumbing pipes are bursting everywhere because we got no one who knows how to do anything except talk. Praise the Lord, there's more than just preachers out there, but you see, God sets up all the people of this world, businessmen, all the way, down, all the way to, to, uh, to, to tradesmen, to people who take the garbage out. Everybody is set up in this world at, with, with a purpose in their heart to spread the gospel. You can be the biggest evangelist in the world going to someone's house and fixing their pipes. The, pro, the thing is, is that when we become so focused on the value of the world, the eternal value becomes a little useless to us. What we need to do is realize that the value of the world in eternity is useless compared to the value of the eternal things of God. And that's what Paul was saying. I learned that all the stuff I put my entire life into didn't amount to anything. And what amounted to something was the power of God that he wants to put into me. Man, what, a, what, what, what kind of power would this church have if everybody here was sold out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday? What kind of, what kind of, what kind of strength would evangel look like a year from now if everybody said, I'm no longer just going to take a spoonful of the goodness of God on a Sunday. I'm going to take it every day, every day of my life. It would be a game changer. It would be a game changer. The next thing he said is that the worthless things of life became valuable. He said, uh, the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, it says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. A faith in what isn't seen, heard, felt, is worthless to many people today. Our faith in Jesus Christ still seems crazy to a lot of people. How can you sit there and sing a song and lift your hands? That's weird. Well, it's because they haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good. How do they do that? Well, by Christians not taking a spoonful of God and taking everything that God has. That's how people see it. But you see, Paul realized that the foolishness of the world, the foolishness in the world's mind was exactly what the doctor ordered, was exactly what he needed. You see, those who grab a hold of the cross and the power of the cross understand that the power of God is in that, and that's what changes it. But that's exactly what the foolishness of, of preaching is, going up to a friend you work with and saying, hey, have you ever heard about Jesus? This is what he did in my life. You're crazy, man. I know, but I like it. I know, but I like it. You see, the Bible says in, in, in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift is eternal life. Now, who would not want, who in this world wants to go to hell? Absolutely nobody. But you see, when, 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 when believers put more of a focus on the material things of earth instead of the, the spiritual things and powerful things of God, it puts a bad taste in the mouth of the sinner. That's the problem. It puts a bad taste in the mouth of the sinner. It's kind of like when we have awesome praise and worship and, and an unbeliever comes into the church and sees Christians just... <laughs> Who wants that? <laughs> Who wants that? You see, but that's, that's, not, that's not, not unnormal in our world today. What we need to be is supernatural. We need to be supernatural. I like this lady. She needs to come home with us. I like her. You keep shouting, it makes me preach longer and better. And that's what we need today. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! <laughs> that's what we need. We need to be people who are not just based on our natural feelings. Our natural feelings says, I'm tired today. I don't like this song. Why is that guy wearing a vest with pink diamonds on it? I don't know. I... I don't think I want that. I, I, no, no, our natural self says no, but our spiritual self says this is Jesus we're talking about. Let's get some. Let's get some. And that's where the shift happens. That's where we begin to realize the value in, in the presence of God is not just something we can we have to come here for it. It's something we can get in our homes, in our car, everywhere we go. You see, if you want a revival to take place, not in, in your life and all around here, it starts by us realizing that there's more to God than Sunday. There's more to God than just the little bit that we get. There's more to God. Someone give him praise. Someone clap your hands for the Lord. That's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> Mary Poppins' Christianity makes you feel condemned. But Jesus... He says there's no condemnation. And that's the difference. So if you're here today as a believer in Christ and you feel like you struggle, you feel just 
it's a struggle every single day. It's so hard to live this life with Christ. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, we need to put the spoon away and just jump into the bucket. Because the Bible says in Proverbs that the way of the sinner is hard. It doesn't say the way of the righteous. We have struggles. I mean, you guys know more than anybody what persecution is like. But you know, I read in my Bible when Paul the Apostle was persecuted, he had great joy, exceeding joy. You see, you don't have to have a perfect life to have joy all the time. You just need Jesus. You just need everything that he's got. And that's where the, that's where the difference is. Keeping the valuable, valuable. That's what we need to do. We need to keep the valuable, valuable. The Bible says, this is, what, this is what Paul said at the end of Philippians, for his sake, I've discarded everything else and counted it all as garbage. Discounted everything else. Here, here's, an, here's an illustration for you. You're at home, you have small kids like me, and you have a bunch of food. You take a chicken out, you put it in the fridge, which we do, from the freezer, and you forget about it for a week and a half. And then you realize it's no good anymore. And if you feed that chicken to your kids, it's going to make them sick. That's terrible. So what do we do with that? We toss it. We don't have a green bin there. We don't care about the environment in the United States. Freedom. <laughs> we, don't care. We, just, we just throw it in the dumpster and say, all right, or just throw it out into the field and some coyote will get it or something. I don't do that because I don't own a gun. I, if I did, I'd be fine with it. Baiting. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it's Maine. You don't understand. It's all right. <laughs> I take the chicken, and I don't feed it to my kids because it's going to hurt them. We would never dream of going through our trash cans and hashing out this old stuff covered in, in, in yesterday's ugh and bringing it out and say, here, kids, here's what's going to give you sustenance. Here's what's going to give you what you need to get through the day. And we, what we do is we put it in bags, and we throw it to the curb, or we throw it in the dumpster. But why do we do that spiritually? Why do we rehash things? Why do we live on yesterday's blessing? Why do we live on what happened 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago? That's not what God's best for you. God has new mercies for you every day. It's new every day. We shouldn't be living on last Sunday's blessing. We need to be living on the blessing of God every day. And the old things of life, the old things of life that you know and I know and everybody knows tears you down, we often run back to them. It doesn't have to be the big... Uh, you know, the, uh, the, big, the big in lights, the, the marquee sins, you know, like being addicted to drugs. It could be just a bitter spirit. It could be a prideful spirit. It could be a gossiping mouth. Why do we keep running back to those things that we know are going to damage us? It's because we've only taken a spoonful of God for the past week. And that needs to change. I'm looking at people that I know you, you want it. I know you guys want it. You guys, I remember, I think it was the last couple times I was here, there's way more people in the house of God today. And it's awesome to see. But now it's time for the people that are here to, 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 to grab a hold of the goodness of God and just run with it. He, he, here's what it is. Here's what it is. You see, you've got the goodness of God. Why do you need anything else? You don't need to add this to anything. You just open it. And, uh, oh, yeah, that's it. That is what you need to do. Mm. This is like a children's dream. Oh, yeah. Excuse me while I go to the bathroom and throw up. That's what it is. Man, it does not come out very easy. I'm sorry. Have you got any milk? The milk is the Holy Spirit. Oh. That's good. We would never put that into our bodies because we added so much. Because when we just added this to our life and added this to our bowl, it got covered with all the stuff that shouldn't be there. We don't need to add Jesus to our life. We just need him. That's it. It's all encompassing. It's already there. Everything that we need is right there. Every bit of faith that we need is right there. Every bit of hope we need is right there. Every bit of victory we need is right there. Every bit of freedom we need is right there. Every bit of anointing we need is right there. Every soul that needs to be saved is found in Jesus Christ because his kindness, his mercy, his goodness leads people to repentance. It's our job to be filled with his power, open our mouths and tell the word it's his job to change the heart. But we're not going to get there until we just Dive into his goodness. Not just a spoonful, but the whole thing. The whole thing. Every day. Every one of you need to go, go home and buy a roll of cookie dough and just eat it. And remember 
that the Lord is good. The Lord is all you need. He is all you need. You see, and the Bible says, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament of one story, and I'm going to finish up right here real quick. So I don't know if there's a band wants to come up. Do they come up? They can. Come on up and sing something awesome. <laughs> in, in 2 Kings 17, there was, the Assyrians were settling the land of Israel. They had taken over Israel. And they settled the land of Israel. And they brought their paganism. They brought their godlessness. They brought their, their religions, child sacrifices and all. They were horrible people. And God was not happy about it, and so he sent a lion into the land, and it ravaged everybody. And so these Assyrian leaders said, we can't do this in this land. We've got to pay homage to the God of this land. So you know what they did? They built, <coughs> excuse me, they built a shrine to Jehovah, to God. And they began to worship him. They, they got people from Israel that were alive to show them how to worship God. And you're probably, you know, people thinking like, yeah, this is awesome, this is great. But you know what they also did? They kept worshiping their own idols. They kept worshiping their own things because all they did was take a little bit of God and add it to their paganism. God was not happy with it. And eventually the Syrians got taken over by the Babylonians. That tells me, church, this one thing is that when, if you want to have an encounter with God that is life long loved. <laughs> Sorry. That is, <laughs> I try to say 15 different things at once. Man, I was on it too. Huh. If you want to have an encounter with God that is lifelong, that is impactful, you can't just simply take the good things that God has and just add it. You can't just make it an additive. You can't just squeeze him into your life. God is a jealous God, not because he's looking behind a, 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 you know, a big bush with his binoculars and seeing, oh, he is sinning. It's not the jealousy that he has. He's jealous for your heart. He's jealous for your heart because he wants you with him, not with the devil, not with the enemy, not with, not with anything. He wants you. That's why he sent his son. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he made a way where there was no way. That's why he did it. So when we just take him and add him to our life, we're telling God that, you know, we love you. You're important, but so is everything else. But so is every other idea. So is everything else that I do in my life that, that makes me feel good and makes me feel happy and, and makes me feel in control. When God says, you don't need to feel in control, I already am. Just take me, all that I am. And that's what God wants. You might say, well, that's an awful lot for just a plain old me to do. Well, David was just... He was just a shepherd who was a forgotten seventh child, eighth child. And there are some Jewish historians who believe he was an illegitimate son of, of, uh, of Jesse and, and some maiden. So he might even have been just an outcast, an outsider. But you see what David did that was different was when he was in the fields all by himself while everyone else was out being prominent. He sat and he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. I bless the Lord. He began to write songs of worship and praise, and his heart was completely about the Lord. We know David wasn't perfect, but God used him in a mighty way. I just stepped on cookie dough. I'm so sorry. I'll clean that up later. That's bad. Dave, <laughs> that's already been added. I don't want that. David was a man who's after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, but because he didn't just add God to his life. God became everything. Everything. Paul the Apostle, everything. Peter, Peter had some ups and downs, but Jesus became everything. And men and women that you've known and that I have known, great leaders, we've seen them, we've seen them pay a price to become the powerhouses for God that they are. But in the end, it's always worth it. In the end, it's never worth taking a little bit of Jesus and adding it to our, our broken lives. In the end, Take everything that he is and let him take everything that you are. And just watch what he does. Just watch what he can do. That's the greatest hope we have as people. That we don't have to be slaves to our past. We don't have to be slaves to our failures and our shortcomings. We don't have to be slaves to what we can't do. We can be children of God. We can be children of God. Last thing before we pray. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. We read it already tonight. Today it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I love the way he, he words that. The wages 
Wages are what you earn. You work and you get a wage. You earn it. Our sin earns death. But the gift of God, it's not something we earned or deserved. It's just the gift of God is eternal life. And so when you take hold of the goodness of God and you give him your sin, you give him your past, you give him your mistakes, you give him your fears, you give him your worries, your, your condemnation, and everything that you've got, you just give it to the Lord. He, takes on, he took on the death that we deserve so we could take on the life that we never earned and never could. And that's the hope that people need to see in the church today. That's the hope that people need to see in the house of God. That's the hope that your friends and your loved ones that don't know Jesus are looking for you because they know you go to church. And they're saying, is it real? Well, when you make it more than a spoonful of God, it will be real. It will be absolutely real. And then when you mess up and make a mistake, it's not going to be the end of the world. You're going to be like, you know what? I messed up, but God's still good. And they're like... I want to get saved. And it's over. It's great. I've seen it happen again and again and again. And I want to see it happen here. And I believe it will. Because I'm looking at a people that realize a little bit's not enough. A little bit's not enough. Say it. Say it's not enough. It's not enough. Why don't you all stand to your feet? You just close your eyes. Father, we thank you so much for the goodness of God. We thank you, Lord, that you are enough. That my God is more than enough. You can supply all our needs, God. You will provide. God, you will bring healing and deliverance. Lord, I pray that you will increase the faith of your people, that we will be people who are not afraid to stand up for the goodness of God everywhere we go. And Father, when we just add you to our busy life, you just become another piece that we compartmentalize and say, not today, I'm too busy. But when you are the center of it all, that changes everything. That change, there's never a moment that you're not worth stopping for. And God, that's what we want. That's what we need to leave in this place today. With every head bowed and eye closed, I'm going to ask if there's anybody here that doesn't have a relationship with God. You have a busy life. And God wants you to know that he, you don't have to add him to it. He'll take the, the, he'll take the mundane, he'll take the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life. And he'll transfer it and give you the goodness of God today. The Bible says he came and died a sinner's death to pay our penalty of sin. To pay your penalty of sin. So that you could have eternal life in heaven with him one day. All it takes is you simply saying, yep, I want to give my life to Christ and start this to make him the center of it all. Is there anybody here today that say, that's me, I want to give my life to Christ? Just raise your hand up. Is there anybody at all? I think I see a hand back there. Awesome. See one hand. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Praise the Lord. You just say, you know what, I'm starting over today. Praise him, praise him. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to pray with, uh, pray with you. You guys got sent. Jesus is the center, right? Awesome. They're going to sing this song. And if you who raise your hand want to come down and meet me at front, out front, I want to pray with you. And then we're going to pray for everybody else. I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Carmen, and he can take it where he needs to go. But I'd love to pray with you who put your hand up. So go ahead and sing. And uh, you come down and meet me here. Come down and meet me here. And if not, I'll come find you. Because that's what I do.